But we have come uh, together to worship Jesus because this morning, whatever's going on in your life, you are blessed. You are blessed indeed. We're looking at Romans 4 and in that chapter he quotes from Psalm 32, the Psalm of David, which says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one who the Lord does not count against them, whose sin the Lord does not account against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. And for those who've come to know Jesus, we know this morning that we are blessed because our sins are forgiven, our sins are covered. The Lord does not hold it against us. So we are counted among the righteous and therefore we are blessed. Blessed more than those who have wealth and riches. Blessed than those who we think in worldly terms are blessed. The Bible says we are blessed, we are to be envied, we are the happy ones, we are the ones whose God is on our side. And even as this uh, today, we know Sandra is not at all well and we don't know how long she's got left, but we know that she is blessed because her sins are forgiven. She is counted among the righteous because of Jesus. And that is where we are. So I'm not sure I'm allowed to do this, but if I am, and if you're in the same bubble, turn to the person next to you and say, I am blessed. And then you can say, you are blessed. And if you're at home, put it in chat, say it to those there, that we are blessed. Let's stand together if we are able, please. Even if you're at home, it'd be lovely if you could stand as the blessed people of God because of Jesus. And I just want to pray for you as we begin. Pray for you, whatever situation you bring to church this morning or you're watching at home from. I just want to pray that the truth that you are blessed will now just hit you like it's never hit you before. That you are counted among the righteous, your sins are covered and atoned for, and God is for you. The psalmist goes on to say, the Lord's unfailing love surrounds those whose trust in him. His love is around you this morning. Lord Jesus, I just pray for anyone who is not feeling blessed or who is looking for blessings in other ways, that as they come to trust you, Jesus, they will know your unfailing love is surrounding them as the mountains surround Mount Zion. Lord, we ask that by faith, they will know they are blessed and they'll be full of a joy and a peace and abundance that they just want to share others to share with others lord jesus by your holy spirit pour that blessing into our lives as we gather to worship jesus We're going to sing a lovely hymn, And Can It Be? A hymn written by Charles Wesley, who was suffering, who wasn't feeling blessed at all. And he heard the words, in the name of Jesus, believe, believe. And within him, his belief rose and he put his faith in Jesus. And he felt the blessedness of peace with Jesus. And soon after that, soon after his conversion, he penned these lovely words, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood? And as the Spirit comes, knowing that you are blessed, use this lovely hymn to worship Jesus and turn your blessing into worship. Let's sing together.
Romans chapter 4, it really be helpful, it is helpful every uh, time we open God's Word, but particularly uh, this morning, if you had Romans 4 uh, before you, but I'm just going to read Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Sorry, we'll read at 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. A righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, to which the scriptures and the prophets testify. And Romans 4 is Paul's explanation and understanding to those who are struggling with this concept of faith and how the law and the prophets, this concept of faith, is the only way that righteousness can be found. And as I was preparing uh, for this week, I came across this quote, which has been in the back of my mind as I've been looking through Romans 4. And it's a quote about the thief on the cross. We all know the story, Jesus was crucified, there were two thieves on one side, one hurled insults at him, the other said he's done nothing wrong. And he says, remember me. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And reflecting on this, I read this quote from Daniel Varghese, how does the thief on the cross fit into your theology? No baptism, no communion, no confirmation, no speaking in tongues, no mission trip, no volunteerism, and no church clothes. He couldn't even bend his knees to pray. He didn't say the sinner's prayer, and among other things, he was a thief. Jesus didn't take away his pain, heal his body, or smite the scoffers. Yet it was a thief who walked into heaven the same hour as Jesus, simply by believing. He had nothing more to offer other than his belief that Jesus was who he said he was. No spin from brilliant theologians, no ego or arrogance, no shiny lights, skinny jeans or crafty words, no haze machine, donuts or coffee in the entrance, just a naked dying man on a cross, unable to even fold his hands to pray. How does our theology fit into the thief on the cross? And really, can I suggest that that is what Romans chapter 4 is about. This idea of a righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. And there are three things I want to say about this faith. Firstly, I want us to look at the person of faith. That this faith is not a general faith. This faith is in Jesus. Paul is not saying, as we will look in a moment, he's not saying that the law failed and that was the the merit you needed to get into heaven, but now you need the merit of faith. Faith doesn't replace the law. It's not like Lewis Carroll wrote in the story of Alice in Wonderland, when Alice laughed, there's no use trying, one can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the Queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. It's not faith is not the key. It is not about mustering up faith. It's not about the merit of faith. It's not saying if I have huge faith, if I can work it up, that then will then be my merit before God. He will say, look at that faith. Aren't they great? No, that's just replacing the law with faith. Because it's not the faith, it's the person whose that faith is in that matters. Because this is about faith in Jesus. We are saved not by faith. We are saved by grace through faith. 
Faith is the way we access the righteousness, the gift of grace. Paul, as we'll see, goes on to say, verse 4 of chapter 4, Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It is faith in Jesus. It's not something you have to work up. It's not something you have to try hard at, because it's in a person, in Jesus. And as the dying man on the cross believed in Jesus. It wasn't the amount of faith. It wasn't the works of faith. It was because it was Jesus who said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. That's why Jesus says, if you only have the faith the size of a mustard seed you can say to this mountain throw itself into the sea because it's not the faith we don't measure faith we measure the person Jesus who brings the gift so when we think about faith it's not about working up faith it's not about having enough faith it's about looking at the person Jesus and believing in him the second thing, as we'll look through what Paul's argument in Romans 4, is the priority of faith. The priority of faith. That faith isn't just something that suddenly appeared. This is always God's purpose and plan. And he begins by saying, What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? Abraham, who the Jews looked to as the father uh, of, their, of their, their religion, the one who was friends with God, the ones that they were trying to emulate. How did he uh, deal according to nature, according to the flesh? And we read here that he was justified not by works, but by faith. We see that it was practiced even by Abraham, and he talks about how Abraham was righteousness was credited to God, referring back to Genesis, where he was given the righteousness of God by believing the promise of God. What was the promise he believed? The promise was believed that he would become the father of all nations. And he believed God. And Genesis says it was credited to him as righteousness. This is where Abraham began, not with circumcision. And notice, this promise was made before circumcision, before the law. And we'll come on to that in a minute. Faith was the priority. Faith was the first. And it was practiced by Father Abraham. It was also promoted by Scripture. We read here, but not before God, verse 3. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. The priority of faith, belief in Jesus, belief in the promises of God was practiced by Father Abraham. It was promoted throughout Scripture. And then uh, Paul quotes um, Psalm, he quotes David. This whole idea of the forgiveness of sins, the promises of God, believing in the promises of God, has always been at the heart of the blessings of God. Because not only is it practiced by Father Abraham, promoted by Scripture, ultimately it is a present to be received. Because the blessings of God, the promises of God, are gifts, are blessings to receive. And this is the word to be credited, logizomai in the Greek. Something that can't be earned, something that you're not rewarded for, and something that you don't work for, but something that is a gift. That's grace. In a very earthly sense, Paul uses this word in the book of Philemon, when Onesimus, the slave, had obviously run away and taken things from Philemon. And, and Paul says, credit it to my account. It's the same word. I'll take it. I'll take the debt. I'll take what's owned. Because ultimately, 
The promises of God are a gift to be received. You can never earn them. And that's why he quotes from that Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. The one who's the sin the Lord will not count against them. It's a gift. It's a blessing. It's a credit. And so therefore the priority of faith, trusting in the promises of God, is the story of the whole of Scripture. Because it brings glory to God, the great giver. And so faith is the priority. Faith is God's way to receive the blessing and promises of God. And it always has been. We then know that this goes on to say, he then, verse uh, 9 onward, talks about circumcision and uncircumcision. Because then for the Jew, how then, if, if faith is a gift and is the priority of everything, how then do we fit circumcision and the law in? And this is uh, Paul's argument here, is that faith was the priority, it was the first, it's the way it began, and then circumcision came as a sign, verse 11, and he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that the righteousness might be credited to him. So his faith the promise, the blessing of God was given before circumcision. Genesis 15 was when the promise, the credited righteousness was, and 17 was later the gift of circumcision. So what is the circumcision? And this is what he'll impact through the letter, he's began to unpack it, that circumcision is the way into the community is into the way into the community of God's people in the Old Testament. It was the sign of what was going to be the promise that was going to be received. It was the way they were included in the community that owned the blessing and the promise of Father Abraham. And circumcision was the way into belonging to that community of the people of God. And so we'll see, particularly in, in Romans 5 and 6, Paul's argument is that we come to faith in Jesus and circumcision is no longer needed because, as he says, Abraham is to be the heir of all nations and all people, not just the Jews. And so for us as Christians, the way into the community is now not through circumcision, but through baptism. So faith is never surpassed, never exceeded. There's nothing ever greater than faith. But circumcision has been surpassed. Because we're talking not just about the Jewish people who are God's people. Through faith, through this righteousness by faith, it is opened up to be, as it says in this passage, Abraham is heir of all the world, of all nations. And the way into this new community of God's people is not through circumcision, but through baptism. And it's for all people. And so baptism is important as a sign, as a seal of entering into this community, the church, the people of God. But faith is the priority. When you put your faith in Jesus, when you receive his righteousness, you then are baptised to be part of that body and that community. It is important. The thief on the cross, as I always said, if he was offered to be part of the people of God through baptism, would he say, no, I'm all right, I've just believed, I'm going to paradise? No, he would say, if that's what I need to do to be part of this community, the sign and seal, I will be baptised. But circumcision, as Paul will go on through this letter, is to be surpassed by baptism, and it's for all people. Baptism for all of those who have put their faith in Jesus. But faith is the priority. 
That's why we as Baptists say believers baptism. Faith comes first and then baptism is being a sign and seal of being that people of God, the community. So faith became before circumcision. It also came before the law. It also came before the law. And he talks about the law. And the law, verse um, 13 onwards, he talks about it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise. Because the law only brings wrath and judgment. And that's the problem with the law. That actually the law which is there to help the new community of people live according to God's righteousness, it fails because it brings wrath, because we cannot live according to the law. And so Paul would say, it is therefore surpassed, as we'll come on to in Romans 7 and 8, it was re- it's been surpassed by the law of the Spirit. That what I couldn't do because the law condemned me, I now can do through the law of the Spirit who is living through me. And so, I hope you see Paul's argument here. He is showing the priority of faith, that faith is never surpassed. Faith is always the way to receive the blessing and mercy and forgiveness of God by believing in the promises of God. It was practiced, it was shown by Father Abraham. It's always promoted by Scripture. It is a grace, it is a present to be received and can't be earned. And it came before circumcision, which has been surpassed by baptism. And it came before the law, which has been surpassed by the law of the Spirit. And that's what the rest of his letter is going to unpack. What does the law of the Spirit, what does the way into this community, what does this one new community look like? And that's the heart. Because remember, this is a divided community of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians trying to work it out together, being divided and separated. And yet Paul's whole argument is faith is the priority and it then gets worked out into a new community of all people, one people together through baptism, coming together as one who live out a righteous life, not by following the law, but by listening and allowing the Spirit to reign in them and live life through them. And that's what the rest of Romans is going to help us think about. So faith, we need to think about the person of faith, the priority of faith. And then in verse 16 to 25, we see the practice of faith. What does actually faith look like? What does it mean to have faith? Just by faith, what does that mean? And firstly, we see that faith comes by a promise. Verse 16, therefore the promise comes by faith so that it it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, both those of the law and those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Faith comes by a promise. The promise of God. The promise of God that through Jesus' death, as we saw last week, the pollution of sin, the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and uh, anyone remember the last one? Uh, the, uh, something else of sin. It has all been dealt with. It has all been dealt with. Sin no longer can pollute me or have a power over me. The penalty has been paid. And I know that I am loved. I think it was passion, wasn't it? I know that I am loved by the love of God. That's the promise. That's the promise. And that is the gift of God. But faith believes the promise. The promise of Scripture. As we read in verse 4 earlier, that the promise was in Scripture. It's based in the truth of God's Word. The promise of what God has said. And faith in Jesus is that believing the promise of what he's accomplished on the cross and through his death and resurrection is what I receive. 
because faith is based on the promises of God, is based on Jesus. It's not positive thinking. It's not hopeful thinking. It's based on the promises of God. And that is my saving faith, how I become part of God's family. But it's also the way I exercise faith daily, by believing the promises of God. As you know, I, I uh, went to Spurgeon's College, and one of Spurgeon's favourite books is The Check Book of Faith. And he writes this, A promise from God may very, very instructively be compared to a cheque payable to order. I know we don't have cheques these days, but I think I'm of a generation that we all know what cheques are. It is given to the believer with the view of bestowing upon him some good thing. It is not meant that he should read it over comfortably and then have done with it. No, he is to treat the promise as a reality, as a man treats a cheque. He is to take the promise and endorse it with his own name by personally receiving it as true. He is by faith to accept it as his own. He sets to his seal that God is true, and true as to this particular word of promise. He goes further and believes that he has the blessing in having the sure promise of it, and therefore he puts his name to it to testify to the receipt of the blessing. This done, he must believingly present the promise to the Lord as a man presents a cheque at the counter of the bank. He must plead it by prayer, expecting to have it fulfilled. If he has come to heaven's bank at the right date, he will receive the promised amount at once. If the date should happen to be further on, he must patiently wait till its arrival. But meanwhile, he may count the promise as money, for the bank is sure to pay when the due time arrives." Some fail to place the endorsement of faith upon the cheque and so they get nothing. And others are slack in presenting it and these also receive nothing. This is not the fault of the promise but of those who do not act with it in a common sense, business-like manner. Faith is based in the promise of God. It's believing that what God says is true and you can receive it and you can bank it and you can bring it towards God as done. Faith is based simply on the promises of God. Faith in Jesus. Our salvation comes as we simply believe, as that thief on the cross did, that Jesus was the King of Kings. He was God, and he died on the cross to deal with sin so that I could be blessed and enter into the kingdom of God so my sins will be forgiven and not counted against me and so the righteousness of Christ will become mine and as that lovely hymn we sang with, we can therefore boldly come into the throne room of heaven presenting the promises of God, receiving what we need. Because faith is based in the promises of God. It's based in Jesus and the promise of salvation in his name. It comes, it comes, but it also comes not just by the promise, it comes by the power of God. Verse 17, we read this. He is our Father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Our faith is based in the promise of God, but also the power of God, that he has the power to deliver what he has promised. That God is able. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. The God who can do the impossible. The God who can give life, who can raise dead. The God who is the God of the impossible, the God of all power. This is the God who has made the promises. And my faith is in the promise of God, but also a God who has the power to deliver on the promise. It is about trusting in the promise of of God and the power of God that he is able to do what he has promised 
And that's what when uh, Paul returns to Abraham, who we read, who, who believed God despite his recognizing, we read verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was almost about 100 years old and that Sarah's room was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Faith comes by listening and believing the promises of God and belief in the power of God to give life, to do the impossible. It also comes with the provision of God. That the promise of God that God will provide, that this is future, that Abraham's faith was not fulfilled straight away. It did not happen as soon as he believed God. He suddenly then, his Sarah didn't suddenly then get pregnant and he suddenly inherited everything and got a son and nation. It was a provision. God was waiting. It was future. And God's promises come with hope. Abraham, without hope, we're told, believed in hope because faith comes with the provision of God, comes with the hope that what he has promised will come true. And ultimately our faith is in the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Our faith is in the hope of God's kingdom coming and ruling and reign. In the words of that song, there is a light that is coming. There is future provision. All sin has been dealt with. The consequences of sin has been dealt with, which mean that all sin will be judged and God's kingdom without sin, without death, without tears, without sickness is coming. And my faith is that I will be part of that. My faith is not just about the present. It is so much more about the provision of God has for us in the future. And in our culture, it is so difficult because it's all about the I and the now and the instant society, that we want everything now and we want our faith to bring the blessings now. But the future of faith is God will honour his promises. A day is coming when he will come again and establish his kingdom of righteousness. It's a faith of hope. Faith is being certain, the writer to the Hebrew says, of what we hope for. Yes, and the substance, the present reality of it, but it's not, it is a future blessing that we receive in part in the present. And so we look forward, faith to the future. It comes from the promises of God, listening to the promises of God, it's based on the power of God, it is something that comes with the provision of God. It is future. We wait for it. But faith also comes by persuasion. We read early that, that, that Abraham was aware of the impossibility of the promise of God. But we read that he was fully persuaded. He was fully persuaded of the truth that God could do this, that God could come on through, that God could fulfill his promise. And we read he didn't waver, literally at odds with himself. He didn't have this internal debate, can God, can not, the, the, the unsettling feeling of will it happen, will it not happen, it may, it may not, this idea of staggering between two views and two thoughts. He became persuaded. He was persuaded, what was he persuaded? But he was also persuaded about the resurrection, the power of God to give life. This was what he was persuaded for. And we need to be persuaded of the reality of our situation, 
That's what the first few chapters of Romans is about, the reality of our sin and our fallenness and our brokenness and how we haven't lived up to the glory of God, how we failed and how we recognise this problem is within me, the problem that pollutes every area of my life, that I am weak, I cannot save myself, I cannot overcome my natural selfish desires and greed expressing in so many different things. My heart is wrong. I recognise the reality of the situation. There is no hope for me in myself, but also I believe in the resurrection that God can give life to what is dead. God can bring forgiveness. God can give righteousness. God can do the impossible. And can I suggest Abraham, the man of faith, was fully persuaded, was fully persuaded without the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And Paul ends this chapter with the evidence that should persuade us unequivocally. He puts this, a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is it circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is a circumcision... Sorry, I'm reading the wrong verse. That doesn't help, does it? Let's end. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 23. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us all, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. It is Paul saying Abraham did not have the resurrection. He had it pointed to when he went to sacrifice his son. But for us, we have the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our faith is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he conquered the death, that he overcame the consequences of sin and therefore we have the promise we have the power we have the provision and we have the persuasion of God ultimately in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our faith is in the death and resurrection of Christ because it's the promise of God that we'll be saved that we'll be free that we'll overcome death but it's also showing us the power of God to do it that if Jesus conquered death so can you so can I and it's the future, knowing that death is not the end, the future lies ahead of us. And so we are persuaded when we see the reality of our lives, but we see the power of God in the resurrection, because it is the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ that proves to us that our faith in Jesus can be trusted. And that's why I really encourage you, Alpha Course, tomorrow evening, get people along. We're looking at who is Jesus. At the heart of the first one on the Alpha Course, most of the session is about did Jesus rise from the dead? Because it's the resurrection of Jesus which shows the promise and the power and the provision of God is true. And we need to be fully persuaded. Paul says uh, that if it, without the resurrection, we are to be pitied above all people people. One famous archbishop said, no resurrection, no Christianity. Ultimately, it is the resurrection of Jesus of which our faith is. That's why Paul in Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe he's God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, because it is faith in the resurrection of Jesus that is the saving faith that we need. Because we finally know that faith comes with permanence. That we faith comes with permanence. Because once I've believed, once I've become persuaded, I am then therefore, as, as Abraham was, strengthened by faith. Verse 16, guaranteed the resurrection. Because as soon as I believe in Jesus, as soon as I call out to him, as soon as I say to Jesus, remember me, as soon as I acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and I believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, as soon as I realise that he died for my sins and was raised to life that I may know the righteousness of Christ and the way of the Spirit, 
as soon as I believe that, something happens. That faith means that Jesus comes into my life. That faith means I am then strengthened because this Jesus, the righteousness comes into me by faith. I have clothed myself with Christ. Christ comes in me by the Spirit and I am changed and my faith is strengthened and my faith is permanent. I cannot lose that faith because it's in a person. And as soon as I put my faith in him, he comes into me. That relationship is established. And that faith is strengthened. And Jesus is with me. And therefore, I then say I want to be part of his community. And so I choose baptism. I then realise that I cannot follow the law on my own, but then after I've been baptised, the Holy Spirit can fill me and I can live by the law of the Spirit as I listen to the way of the Spirit. That is faith. So as I close, do you have faith in a person? Have you come to believe in Jesus? Wherever you are, whatever you've done, Can you be persuaded by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead that the promise of God is true of your forgiveness of sins and salvation, that the power of God is able to do that and that the future of eternal life can be yours because of the righteousness of Christ? Today, believe in Jesus. Have you been baptised? Is it now time to having believed to be part of this worldwide community? Join with the people of God and seek the power of the Spirit to live a new way. That's our salvation. That's the righteousness by faith. But for those of us who have said, for those of us who have known that, can I encourage us that we be strengthened in our faith, as I said last time, by focusing on the cross, focusing on the promises of God. Don't focus on yourself to live this Christian life. Don't focus on the sin you're trying to overcome. Focus on the cross. Focus on Jesus. I've used this analogy before, but I've just started to play golf again. And my great challenge is I'm usually not too bad. Um, but when, as, is that right, Neil? Not too bad. But when I come to uh, a tee where there's some water, now in golf you have to avoid water at all costs. But I find that when I come to the tee, I'm about to tee off, there's water over there, loads of space over there. I want to hit it over there. But I find every time when I take my tea, where does it land? In the water. Why is that? I think it's because subconsciously I'm thinking water, avoid water, avoid water, avoid water, water. (laughs) And that's the same about faith. We can think about all the things we want to avoid, all the things how we want to live for Jesus, all the things that we want to not do and and try and overcome. But somehow when, when, when we say, I mustn't do that, I must live by faith, I must live righteous, and we focus, I can't do that, I can't do that, we end up doing it. Whereas if we focus on faith, if we focus on Jesus, if we believe in Jesus and look to Jesus, then these other things just get avoided. So let's fight, focus on the cross. And then as we read Scripture, as we read the promises of God in Scripture, hopefully you're doing the Bible in one year, but as you do that, underline the promises of God. See what it says about what God has promised in Christ. Underline it and see it as a check for you to bank, to take to God in prayer to believe because of Jesus' death and resurrection, all the promises of God are yes and amen. That's the challenge. Believe in Jesus if you haven't. Make faith your priority. Focus on the word and believe. And practice faith as you fix your eyes on Jesus.
Let's pray as we prepare to sing our closing hymn. Lord Jesus, there's so much in Paul's argument. But may we see what faith is. It's faith in a person. It's faith in the promises of God in Christ. It's faith in the resurrection of Jesus that proves the power of God. So may we see Jesus. May we hear his promises. And may we believe. Let's close by singing together. Into the darkness. And let's praise our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
so Lord as we go from here may we be strengthened by faith as we again look to Jesus and put our faith in him for our salvation for our deliverance for our victory and may we go knowing that that is certain and we can boldly approach the throne with all the promises of God that are yes and amen in Christ. Strengthen us and may we go out boldly and strongly, convinced that Jesus is with us. Amen. Amen. Well, it's 21 on Zoom already.